Hey everyone, welcome back to Dustin Fowler's AP Human Geography channel. In this section, we're going to talk about, or we've been talking a little bit about the basic concepts. Don't forget also about my five themes of geography video that I made earlier. A lot of stuff that's covered in the first chapter or the first unit of AP Human Geography deals with the five themes of, of, of geography. Uh, the, the Mr. Help acronym. We've already spent a lot of time in the first video here talking a little bit more about location. We're not going to spend as much time looking at region, looking at uh, uh, you know anything much more than human environment interaction. So go back and check out that video if you're confused or if you have any questions about it. In the meantime, let's pick up where we left off. We had just gotten done talking about maps and mapping. Now we're going to continue looking at the spatial analysis concept of human geography by explaining how we use technology such as GIS, and remote, remote sensing and GPS to, to figure out things about the Earth in terms of location and its characteristics. So first of all, it's important to know uh, what these different technologies are and what they're used for. And so let's look first at the one that we're all the most familiar with. Most of us have this on our phone. Most of us have it on our, in our cars or whatnot. The idea behind the GPS, a global positioning system that allows us using a series of satellites to understand exactly, precisely where things are located on the Earth. I mean, how cool is it that I can be driving somewhere God knows where, and immediately it will tell me where to turn, it will tell me which exit to take, it will tell me which lane I should be in. The other day I was driving through Atlanta, thinking I was going to lose my mind trying to get my daughter to Legoland, and sure enough, man, my GPS came through for me. My guess is that in our lifetimes, we're going to see GPS play a way more pivotal role in what's going on, even than it already does. For example, um, you've got Amazon talking about well, uh, using drones to deliver our packages. Well, they're probably going to use some degree of GPS to figure out how to get things from where, from wherever they're going to another. Also, our phones always ask us about location or services. Windows 10 just came out, and it's all about invading privacy and figuring out, you know, where, where, where do we live? Want to have, put a tag on everything we do. Remote sensing is another really important piece of technology that geographers are going to use. It helps us to know a lot more about the world in which we live. For example, using remote sensing, we're able to figure out, again, using satellite images, uh, uh, different types of characteristics of our Earth. We can see different types of heat patterns. We can see different types of, of maybe vegetation or things like this using different types of signals. Now, I'm not super expert on remote sensing, but we use it for understanding things from a from a standpoint of uh, an airplane or an aerial view, something that's way more and way beyond just our simple perspective and our simple observation. And what we can do is we can take a snapshot of like an entire uh, region or an entire uh, 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 physical feature or something like this. And it's really, really cool the way that works out and the things that the science behind that allows geographers to do. Probably one of the most important applications we see with remote sensing has to do with the you know, weather patterns and climate and things of that nature. Finally, there is the Geographic Information Systems or the GIS which takes all sorts of quantitative data about something on the Earth and puts it into a nice, user-friendly, easy-to-read, easy-to-understand map. Want to know where you should build a new school? Well, why don't you use GIS to figure out the, the elevation, to figure out the um, kids that are in whatever region, um, figure out where people are going to go to this school to the next, where the, um, the neighborhood's at, where, where students are going to come from, uh, where are the roads located, what other types of landmarks. What area gives you the most land that you can build your fields on or your gymnasiums or whatever else it is you're going to need? These might be some of the things that you would use GIS to, to understand. Other types of businesses might use uh, GIS in similar ways to figure out where to locate their new shops or where to uh, uh, put a business, you know, where they're going to draw the most consumer crowd. Quantitative data has to do with that uh, that deals with numbers, all right? So we're looking at numbers and things that we, that people like me, I'm not good at math, man. I can't figure out numbers very well, but you put it on a map and it makes sense for me. It's aesthetically pleasing. This is kind of the purpose behind GIS and it's a major helpful tool that geographers have at their disposal for understanding and learning more about the Earth. Once again, looking at uh, the spatial element of human geography and something else you're going to use maps to understand is the names of places. That's right, we're talking about toponyms. Toponym being the place names. So oftentimes, something else you're going to see, and, and you, we need to understand when we're studying human geography, is that these place names are named after some, uh, uh, you know, something to do with the culture that names them. All right. So in the United States, you might see a, a ton of different uh, cities or places or intersections or road names that are named after, say, Martin Luther King Jr. Or maybe something that has like a like a, a Christian background, like for example, St. Charles, a city. 
Um, you might have other other toponyms that are rooted in Christianity, rooted in, in uh, uh, American history or something when you're here. If you're in other places, you're going to see stuff that deals with their government or their culture. For example, Stalin named the capital city there, Stalingrad, uh, um, you know, named after himself. Probably the single biggest reason for why we do things like this is because we as human beings, we, we develop what we call a sense of place or a sense of belonging, a sense of attachment to places that we live and places that make us feel the most at home or at peace or whatever it might be that defines how we feel about this sense of place. Not only does this kind of explain why we name things what we name, but it also explains our monuments and our important buildings and maybe even things like the importance of the confederate flag to some people who say it's a symbol of southern heritage versus others that say it's a symbol of racism. Another element playing into the idea of a sense of place is sight and situation. All right, so you've got these two words here, and I mentioned the five themes of geography video that I made. That we're going to be talking a little bit more about what site and situation actually are. And the reason for this is because they're synonymous with parts of the five themes of geography, more or less. Site is another word for place. People are going to ask themselves, what is it like? What are the characteristics of a location? This is what site tries to explain to you. Something else that we need to think about when we think about site and place characteristics is the human element of that. Things that we build can be changed. The earth can be changed for things that we build. And so it's important to know that site is something that can be manipulated and adapted to meet the needs of human beings. A really good example of this, there are several. First of all, you've got New York City where most of Manhattan is built on some degree of a landfill. You've got the Netherlands, which builds these polders so that they have more land and prevent their the internal, uh, the, the inside of their country from flooding because of the waters and the sea to the north. Still today, you've got others that are building islands in the middle of the South China Sea because of different types of land disputes. And, and so this is a big thing that's in the news right now that shows proof that human beings are able to manipulate and change the, the characteristics of a place where they live, the site. Situation is also something that can be changed over time, and sometimes we human beings can change it, and sometimes we can't. For example, when we think about a situation, I know with relative location, I explained it to you guys in the five things of video, five things of geography video that I made, in terms of explaining where to get something. Or we might know how to get McDonald's by looking at other landmarks. But if you were to look at a map of Hawaii, they might show the situation of Hawaii by showing uh, a star where Hawaii is on a world map. So that you'll know, oh, Hawaii is kind of way off the coast of the United States, but it's still part of the United States. So in that case, how do we get, how, how can we possibly change the situation of Hawaii? I bet we could blow them up. Can we blow them up? No, just kidding. I really don't want to blow up Hawaii. But we could blow up Hawaii, right? So if we ever figured out, if we were decided that's what we wanted to do, we could in fact change its situation. Now that's pretty extreme and pretty crazy. And I'm not saying anybody should go blow up Hawaii. Please God, don't blow up Hawaii, okay? Okay, but we blow up buildings and schools and doctor's offices every single day, right? Don't, can't we tear down a building that used to be a school and locate that school somewhere else? Thus, we have changed its situation, haven't we? And so we can, and we do have the ability to change where something is situated on earth. Um, yes, landmarks and physical features and things like this might be a lot harder to change, but we can do it if we put our minds to it. Kind of bringing us into the next topic we're gonna talk about, the, the struggle between those who used to believe in environmental determinism, or that is, the, 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 the fact that the environment determines how you're going to grow as an individual from a cultural standpoint, and possibilism that demonstrates how human beings, through their own wits and own intelligence, are able to adapt and, and, and change the earth to meet their needs and grow in whichever way they choose to do. So let's talk about that a little bit and look at cultural ecology. The idea that we interact in, in the way that we do with the earth around us um, and, and we do it from a standpoint of, 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 from a cultural standpoint and from a social standpoint, uh, we, the way we interact with the world around us in the U.S. may be very different from how they do it in the Middle East or in Asia. Also, I'm not so dumb as to think that if I lived in the mountains, I wouldn't live a little bit differently than I do being on the, basically the southern U U.S. along the coastal state. Also, if we lived in Minnesota, where I've got some relatives up there, it gets freakishly freaking cold and I wouldn't be able to 
to live the same in the winter time as I do down here. I'd have to adapt in some way. These adaptations might not be super extreme, but they do show up in the way that people live on a cultural and social level. So what then is environmental determinism and is it real? Well, uh, uh, geographers that uh, that believed and and adhered to the the, the discipline of, or I guess the uh, concepts of environmental determinism were those that believed that the environment caused social uh, growth, whatever that might be. And so when you look at this in terms of Europe, well, in the 15, 1600s, Europeans started to explore everything. And, and uh, for the longest time before that, in the dark ages, we were playing catch up, but we started to explore. And then from there, we started to create industries that needed raw material. And so you've got the age of imperialism. And during this time, man, Europeans thought they were awesome. We were so cool. We were going everywhere and doing what we needed to do to get our materials, to make all of our stuff. And then we thought that everyone in the world wanted to buy those things. Eurocentricism is the understanding or the, I guess the developed idea that Europe is better than everyone else. And we began to think from an intellectual standpoint that, well, well, the reason why we're better is because of the environment in which we live. We have those uh, those temperate climates that are really good for farming. Uh, obviously, we have materials that we can use for like coal and iron. We can use for industries and things of this nature. And if the people in Africa will have had these things, they will have the environment that we have, then they would be dominating the world. Right? Human geography student, it is important to know that no one still adheres to the understanding of or to the to the philosophy of environmental determinism. No one still believes that the environment is the determining factor of how a social group or a cultural group is going to emerge and grow. Rather, what we believe today is that people are able to adapt to the world around them. And those adaptations are gonna be different from region to region, even in places where climates and terrain are very, very similar. I mean, as human beings, we don't like the idea of, of, of feeling that some are just better than others because of destiny. Now, while I'm not saying that everyone deserves a trophy, what I am saying is that it's kind of sad and bleak and miserable to think that in places where population is growing the most today and where development is the lowest, is these people are going to be doomed to uh, eternal poverty on Earth simply due to the fact that their geography makes them less than everyone else. And we've already seen where this is not always the case. Today, we believe that some of the most poverty-stricken places on Earth can, in fact, become great and enter into a world of development in the same way that others in Asia and Latin America have done in the last uh, two or three decades. In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about how that might happen. Using terms like globalization and localization, we're going to learn a little bit about how the world is in the process of becoming exactly the same as other places on Earth, but while at the same time is struggling to maintain its local uniqueness. This struggle God only knows where it's going to go and what's going to happen as a result, good or bad. There is definitely some good and some bad with globalization. So this is what the topic of our next video is going to be. Thank you very much. If you liked the video, subscribe and stay tuned for more AP Human Geography lectures.